On today's show, we take a look at modern slavery. The practice of owning slaves was abolished in the UK 200 years ago, but millions of adults and children are still being trafficked across the world. So what can be done to bring this appalling trade to an end? I'm Shuli Ghosh. This is Insight. Hello and welcome to Insight. Modern slavery is an endemic problem and the vast majority of us know it exists. But according to a survey released this week by the Salvation Army, two thirds of us wouldn't be able to spot the signs. In 2013, more than 30,000 people were registered as human trafficking victims across Europe. Most of them were sexually exploited. One woman told her shocking story to Insight's Sarah Firth. I was being told that I was going to come here to go to school and uh, start working, blah, blah, blah. Then the, the, the guy, then when I came here, then they said I was going to go into prostitution, which I wasn't told, and I wasn't aware that it was going on in the UK. So it was a bit surprising and overwhelming. There was nothing I could do rather than to start arguing and shouting, but it didn't go anywhere, it didn't work, so. And how long did that go on for? Nearly four years. So you were working for nearly four years as a prostitute? Yeah. Yes. I was working with other girls, but I was just like in my room, like um, when the client comes, they'll just knock on your door that you've got a client and yeah, that was it. Were you ever allowed outside? No. No. I was never allowed outside and it's just like um, they come to pick me up. They pick me up from the flat to go to work and when I finish, sometimes I stay in one flat one week, two weeks. You know when you watch a movie and someone is in prison and they can't do anything for themselves? What are your memories of your time in that situation? Uh, I, I don't really know how to explain it. It was, at that time, we were very scared. And, and at that time, I think part of me was just like um, wanting to just pay the money and uh, because they threatened my family. So part of me was just, I just wanted everything to just go away. I still do have nightmares about um, being there because it's like you're just in a cage and there was nothing you could do about it and there was no way to escape and there was no, no way to ask for help. The people that you had contact with, what else did they say to you? Did they speak to you much? Were they abusive? The client? The people who were in charge? Yeah, they were abusive. The guys, yeah, really, really abusive. They tell me all oh, their friends is having a party, and they want to get the, they want, um, they want to take a girl along, and they'll take me when I get there. Still have to give services, and even if it's, they, they, they pay the guys, and I don't have to, I don't have any money. They don't give me the money, so I didn't have any choice. I always try to put on a brave face that because you always have to smile and make them feel welcome and all that thing. Because there was a time that I had an um, issue with one of the clients. It's, 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 the client had to take back their money and I still have to give them the service after they've taken their money. So since that day, I just learned that, oh, okay, you just need to make sure even if when they're rude, when they're grabbing your hair, it's just... <sighs> When did you first think about escaping? 2014, I think I tried escaping like twice before I finally had a, t a chance. The first time was, um, I didn't have to, I didn't go anywhere because the windows are very um, tiny and you can't, I can't even fit my head through, not talk of my body, so I couldn't do anything at that time. Then the second time was um, when I thought that there was nobody and I didn't know that the security guys that always watched the door that let the client in, they were at um, the other side smoking. So I didn't even know that they were, at, they were outside of the door. So when I just came out then, they just saw me and they grabbed me back inside. So 
That was the second time. Then um, the third time was when I finally escaped. I just finished with one of the clients and he gave me a tip because sometimes they give you tip and even in as much as how I should try hard to hide the tip from your people, they're still going to find it because as soon as they get home, you, they search you everything. So, and they still have to find the money with you. So, and that day he gave me 60 pound and it was quiet. Then the receptionist that answered the phone, she was busy because I think she was trying to, there was someone that came to fix the camera in the house. Then this, the, the security guys, I, I couldn't, I didn't see them. So I was just sitting there when I came out to get water to drink. I was just sitting there and I just had this feeling that, oh, this is my chance to escape. So I was just there debating within myself until I finally had the courage to just wear my jeans, my trousers I was having and the t-shirt because I didn't even know what the weather was like outside, if it was cold or hot. So that was why I wore that then when I came out there, everywhere was so bright. I just kept running until I saw a lady which I asked where I was and she told me that I was in Nottingham. Then I asked her that um, where is London, if London is far or if I can walk there. And she was just laughing at me and said, um, you can't walk there, you just have to get a bus and you have to get another bus to London or you have to get a train to London. I just thought that I would be able to find help when I get there. When I saw the police, I was really scared because um, they've told me that when you go to the police, they just have to send you back home and everything. And <sighs> it's all, it was all, um, I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. It was hard talking to the police. I couldn't even think about talking to them because I was so scared. So I just, when I saw them in the train station, I just looked for one way or the other to hide myself and I was really cold. So until I was just, I just came out and start begging and asking people for help and they were just wanting to give you money. Mm -hmm. So, and they're just giving you money and I'm like, I don't want money, but I just want help. Have you been able to forget a bit about what was going on? Sometimes you just, I just want to do everything. You just want to move on. Just want to forgive by everything. But there are some days that it has to come back. Then you're just going to feel like there's no hope anymore. What do you want to happen next for you? I don't know. I don't know. Well, to discuss this further, I'm joined by Andrew Wallace OBE, who is the Chief Executive for Unseen UK, a charity established to disrupt and challenge modern slavery. Um, good to have you with us, Andrew. This is clearly a, a huge and distressing problem. The lady we saw in that video there uh, is Nigerian. Are there certain nationalities that this affects more? We hear about Eastern Europeans, Nigerians as well? I mean I mean, globally, every country of the world has, has got a problem. I mean, here in the UK last year, we saw 102 different nationalities found in situations of modern slavery. Nigeria is one of the top source countries for the UK and also into Europe. But we see victims coming from China, from Vietnam, from Eastern Europe, you know, 102 different nationalities. And the staggering thing is that number five or number six are UK nationals. So it's both an international problem where people are moved around the globe and it's a problem where people are moved around in country. And what happens to these women when they are rescued? So the, for those that are found and want to engage in, the, in a UK context with what's called the National Referral Mechanism, they are then entitled to board and lodging and support services for an initial 45 days. At Unseen, we see them for, on average, about 90 days whilst the decision is made by that country as to whether they're trafficked or not. And then the tragedy is we then take away the safety net. They then have to move on and there's no support services for them. And so as a charity, we, we work with them longer term because our view is that you have to take someone that, that's a victim to a position of surviving and then you have to help them get to a resilient place because where they're not they vulnerable. Because otherwise they could be sucked back into yeah, it. Yeah, we, we see people, you know, re-trafficked around. And, and there's too many stories across the globe and across Europe where you see victims just going round and around 
uh, exploited over and over again. Okay, so we talk about modern slavery. Obviously, this is illegal. Uh, is the, the legislative framework robust enough to deal with this as a problem? Well, in the UK, I mean, last year we passed the, the Modern Slavery Act, which was bringing together disparate bits of legislation and saying, actually, it's a really serious crime. So the tariff, if you're caught now, is all the way up to life. It's also a lifestyle crime, so assets can be seized as well. Um, and there's different legislation across Europe and across the globe. It, it does need improving. And I think, you know, we've got to move from a position of sort of plausible deniability that this is going on. You know, what we're talking about is an illicit trade in human beings. It's worth $150 billion profit per annum. And, and governments around the world are waking up to the fact, and I think prompted by the UK's lead, that they need to do more. But very hard to prosecute. Um, few prosecutions, even fewer convictions. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is that because people are loath to report it? Is it because the victims are loath to give evidence? It's, it's a combination of things. One, it's a very complex crime. It's often a very hidden crime. Perpetrators will often control their victims remotely. And it, you know, in an age of information technology, they're becoming smarter and smarter at that process. Victims don't want to engage. They're terrified of the repercussions, not only against them, but potentially against their family back in, in their source country, in their home countries and so very w unwilling to come forward. But it, what we've learned is if we look after victims really well and we assure them that they're gonna get all the support that they need, then over time they become more willing, just like that brave lady, to tell their story and say, this is what happened to but me. But aren't these big, organized, cross-border gangs that work here? I mean, th this must be incredibly difficult to crack. It's, it's a spectrum that goes from a mom and pop operation. You know, uh, there was a very famous case in Rochdale. You know, a father and son in this country were the, were the traffickers and the exploiters. The grandmother in Romania was the recruiter to sophisticated organized criminal gangs that, you know, on a Monday will do human beings, on a Tuesday will do guns, on a Wednesday will do drugs. You know, very sophisticated cross-border operations. So what needs to happen to make sure that we can cut down on this crime uh, as a society, um, reporting it, seeing it, being aware of it? It's a great question, because actually why has modern slavery come roaring back? 200 years ago, it was outlawed. In essence, what we're talking about is a supply and demand industry. It's, it's an illegal industry. The commodity is a human being. They're being bought, sold, and exploited. Vast profits, low risk of getting caught. But it's a demand that society has created because we want cheap goods. We want cheap services, cheap labor, cheap sex, cheap organs. And there's an endless supply of vulnerable people around the world that the traffickers and the, and the perpetrators of this horrendous crime can just move people in to, to meet that need. Well, let's hope we can all make a difference. Yeah. Andrew, thank you for that. You. Andrew Wallace there. You're watching Insight. Coming up, child slavery. How many children are still involved? Stay with us.